As we near the end of 2022, I've been making some improvements to the channel. One of those was improving my editing skills, but also trying to make the episodes as professional as I can. But now I have another one. Every Monday, I'm gonna be dropping shorter episodes. This will include individual events, biographies, mini rivalries, and so much more. Trust me, I've got some bangers on the way. So let's get into it. Denver, Colorado, not a city you would ever expect to end up on Swamp Stories. Personally, when I think of Denver, well, I'm not sure that's ever happened. But if I did think of Denver, the streets would be the last thing that come to mind. First, of course, would be Subarus, skiers, and Starbucks drinkers. But what if I told you that Denver is four times more dangerous than New York City, two times more dangerous than San Francisco, and slightly more dangerous than the city of LA? In this episode, you'll encounter some of the most bold decisions I've ever covered. Denver is no joke, and it will all make sense on this episode of Swamp Stories. It's 1980 in Watts, California, right in the midst of the worst period in Los Angeles history. Every day is chaotic and the street life is consuming hundreds of teens on a daily basis. All of this led many families down a path of reconsideration. Is it time to leave this beautiful city to escape the environment? Well, three families from Watts finally had enough and decided to pack their bags. Las Vegas, Seattle, Bakersfield, or San Bernardino. These are the cities that most families had moved to. But for these three, they wanted to get much farther away. So collectively, they chose Denver, Colorado. They knew that this would be much different than Watts, but that's what they were looking for. However, due to their financial situation, they moved to the cheapest neighborhood. That would be Northeast Denver, specifically the area around 33rd and Fillmore. When they got there, they realized that it resembled South Central. The neighborhood was poor and run down, but the upside is that it didn't have gangs. This instantly made it a much better environment than what they had come from. They no longer had to look over their shoulder or worry about being pressed. So for the time being, things were calm, but sadly, that wouldn't last long. Each family had teenage boys of the same age. Michael Asbury, also known as Sicko Mike, Philip Jefferson, and Albert Jones, all of whom had spent their formative years in the wild streets of Watts. So when they got to Denver, they were instantly seen as top dogs. They enrolled at Manual High School, just a few minutes from where they lived. This school was no walk in the park, in fact it was the worst school in the whole city. Regardless, the three teens began running the hallways. And what they noticed early on is that everyone respected them. Sicko Mike saw a golden opportunity. He was wild, fierce, and loved to assert his dominance. All he needed was a platform, so he met up with his two friends on 30th and Gilpin. He then pitched them on the idea of starting the Rolling 30s Crips. Both of his friends were ecstatic, and the plan was ready to go. So the three teens began recruiting in the hallways of Manual High School. Membership grew quickly, and this was officially Denver's first LA-style gang. This lonely position would only last for a year and a half. In 1986, another LA section formed in Northeast Denver. Just across Colorado Boulevard, Inglewood's Crenshaw Mafia started a section. They would be centered in what's known as the Park Hill neighborhood. Long story short, the Crenshaw Mafia got involved in the market of Snow White, and this did not make the Rolling 30s happy. They wanted to be the only factor in Denver, and this threat needed to be eliminated. Philip Jefferson would make the first move. On June 12th, 1986, Philip would find two Crenshaw Mafia members on a Park Hill corner, Henry Yeats and Daniel Ramirez, just casually hanging out on the corner. Philip would hop out of his car. According to Denver News, this was the very first tragedy within the beef. And just a few days later, Philip Jefferson would be arrested. Given that this was a major incident, many people expected a harsh sentence, 25 years at the minimum. However, Denver has always been known for a lenient system. Somehow, the judge allowed him to plea down to just six years. And this definitely sent a message to all of the rolling 30s. So after this incident, things would get really bad in Northeast Denver. In fact, it kicked off two decades of Rolling 30s dominance. 
And here's how they did it. The Rolling 30 spawned into three different sections. The Trey Trey Crips on 33rd and Fillmore, the Trey Deuce Crips on 32nd, and the Trey 7 Crips on 37th. Together, this was known as the Triple Trey Alliance. On the other side, you had Crenshaw Mafia, Deuce 7, and East Side 13. All of these resided in the Park Hill neighborhood. Well, after losing two of their members, they all wanted revenge. Philip Jefferson was locked up, so Sicko Mike was target number two. They were relentless to Sicko Mike, but it never went to plan. Between 1986 and 1995, they fired at him 13 times, but never once did they connect. For whatever reason, Sicko Mike was untouchable to the streets and also to the system. In fact, he was arrested 21 times, but never once did a day in prison. This only led him to being more bold. No one in Denver could tell him anything, not even a police police officer. September 5th, 1995. While driving down MLK Boulevard, Sicko Mike gets pulled over by Denver police. Officer Paul Baca gets out of his car to talk to Mike, but Mike is not having it. So Mike jumps out of his car and pummels Officer Baca. He then gathers his saliva and... This was Sicko Mike's 22nd arrest in Denver, and this time he would be prosecuted. The district attorney was able to get Mike to take a six-year plea, but before the official sentencing, an organization would come to Sicko Mike's defense. The Los Angeles-based Amer I Can program heard about the case and sent out an attorney. Instead of a six-year sentence, the attorney asked for a conditional release. Sicko Mike has to move to Compton or South Central, and he cannot return to the state of Colorado. Here was the idea. The attorney told the judge that Sicko Mike wouldn't be able to act the way he does in Denver in the streets of LA. This is what he said. The members in LA are 10 times worse and if he tries to be in the streets, he won't last long. Essentially, the attorney argued that Sicko Mike will have no choice but to turn his life around. On top of this, he claimed that the Denver community would be in support. Well, at the end, the judge decided to sentence him instead. He feared that if he did this, in return, the city of LA would send their members to Colorado. So Sicko Mike sat down for six years. And that takes us to the new millennium. By the year 2000, Denver was seeing crime like never before. Homicide rates higher than many big cities across the country, despite having not that many members. That's because Denver was simply not equipped to handle this issue. The judges were too lenient on giving second and third chances for things that should have been handled right away. And because of this, Denver's criminals were bolder than anywhere around the country. Sadly, the Rolling Thirties would take this to another level. That takes us to New Year's Eve 2000. 2007. The Denver Broncos have just completed their final game of the season. The team had a subpar 7-9 record, but there's a lot of hope in the organization. That's because of a rookie who's emerging as a superstar. This would be Brandon Marshall, a talented wide receiver drafted in the fourth round. The main reason he fell so low was legal and character issues that teams wanted to avoid. Regardless, he kept his act together and balled out his rookie season. So in order to celebrate a year of hard work, Brandon and two teams teammates decide to go out in downtown Denver. That would be third year running back Darren Williams and fifth year wide receiver Javon Walker. Coincidentally, Denver Nuggets star Kenyon Martin is throwing a birthday party downtown as well. So the three Broncos head downtown around 11 o'clock. The Broncos arrive outside the club, and there, a Rolling 30s member named Willie Clark is arguing with the bouncer. The bouncer won't let him in the club, so Willie gets in his face and starts arguing. Meanwhile, Brandon Marshall and the Broncos skip the line and head right in. While he's walking in, Brandon Marshall hears his name being uttered, so he turns around and Willie Clark gets in his face. The two exchange words and Brandon Marshall leaves it alone. About an hour later, Willie Clark returns to the club with his Rolling 30s associate. This time, they get inside and look for the Broncos players. They locate Darren Williams and Brandon Marshall's cousin. And according to witnesses, Brandon's cousin sprays champagne all over Willie Clark. This turns into a verbal altercation, the Rolling 30s versus the Denver Broncos. Everyone heads outside. This is when Brandon Marshall and Willie Clark get into another heated altercation. Willie Clark reaches down to his waistband, prompting Brandon Marshall to say, you ain't got nothing on you. 
For the time being, he was correct, but he also knew that this could change. So Brandon Marshall decides to head home early. Meanwhile, his teammates remain at the club. 20 minutes later, the rest of the Broncos hop in a stretch limousine. The limo heads up Spear Boulevard, but that's when the unexpected occurs. The Rolling 30s have been following them the whole time, so they pull beside the limo at a red light. The story made national news and Denver's district attorney wanted to make things right. However, early on there were no leads on the case. Instead, they conducted raids on the whole Rolling 30s. On February 26, 2007, 49 Rolling 30s were arrested in Denver. What they discovered is that the Rolling 30s were into some serious business. Inside one of the houses, they found $1.5 million in cash. This ultimately sent away a large portion of the Rolling 30s. Unfortunately though, Willie Clark was not included in this. And because of that, the indictment did nothing to bring peace to the Broncos players. The Darren Williams passing devastated the Denver Broncos and none more than Brandon Marshall. He admitted that he felt somewhat guilty knowing that he had escalated the situation. He even told the media that he thinks about it every night. Honestly, you have to feel horrible for him. Yes, he did escalate the argument, but he is in no way responsible for another man's actions. Regardless, the guilt can eat you alive and the only thing you can do is to make things right. All he wanted was justice and a year and a half of uncertainty was difficult. During this period, he sort of had a rough go at things. And it all came out in early 2008 when he was pulled over for DUI. During the stop, he raged at Denver police for not attempting to solve the case that claimed his teammate's life. He also screamed how much he hates the city of Denver and how he can't wait to leave. Not too long after, Javon Walker had a similar incident in Las Vegas. The guys were struggling and it was obvious that they needed their justice. Thankfully, it would eventually come in October of 2008. Willie Clark was officially arrested for the incident on New Year's Eve. During the trial, Brandon Marshall and several teammates took the witness stand against Willie Clark. This handed him a life sentence, bringing peace to everyone around the situation. It's 2008 in Denver, Colorado, and this is what you came here for. The Rolling 30s have dominated Northeast Denver for the past two decades. They were bold against NFL players, police, and definitely their rivals in Northeast Denver. And after the major 2007 takedown, Park Hill took full advantage. So let's get into it. If you remember, Sicko Mike was sentenced to six years. After his release, he got a job and secured an apartment. However, the rival Park Hill still held a grudge against him. May 15th, 2008. 5 a.m. Sicko Mike gets up early to go to work. As he leaves his door, a man is right there waiting for him. This incident was a big deal to the Rolling 30s. Sicko Mike was the equivalent to Raymond Washington in LA. Forever he was seen as untouchable and the fact that they did this was unheard of. Right off the bat they assumed that it was Park Hill who did it. So the Rolling 30s decided to get revenge in a crazy way. May 18th, 2008. Four Rolling 30s members drive out to Park Hill. Trey hunted, Baby Who Ride, Lil Quees, and Lil Mario. They pull up to a known hangout spot, the Holly Square Shopping Center. This is where the Crenshaw Mafia hangs out on late nights. But due to the recent events, they stayed inside on this particular night. When they noticed that nobody was outside, the Rolling 30s got frustrated. So they look around the plaza and think about a plan B. Somehow they decide that arson is the best plan. They drive to the nearest gas station and buy drinks, gas, and lighters. A terrible combo. So they drive back to Holly Square and throw their concoctions all over the roofs. The entire block is in flames. This includes a daycare, a barber shop, and a grocery store.
The rolling 30s hop in their car and run away. 10 minutes later, the fire department arrives. By the time they get there, the entire structure is gone. Everything burned to the ground, over $10 million in damages. Initially, the fire department classified it as an electrical malfunction, but later into the investigation, they found out that it was an act of arson. Here was the big question, who in the world would burn down a shopping center? Well, after a months long investigation, police found that eight people were responsible. By 2010, seven of the members went to prison for over nine years. The one member who was not sentenced was a young lady named Katsina Royval. Instead of prison, they put her on a five year probation. Part of the conditions were that she could only be at home or at work, nothing else. Realistically, this made her a target for revenge. Park Hill knew her only two whereabouts. Unfortunately, they would take advantage of this opportunity. July 12, 2010. It's a steaming hot summer day and it's only right to get some sunlight. So Katsina sits out on her porch to enjoy the weather. But that's when a car stops in front of her house. This story is sad all around, so much unnecessary drama for no reason. Well, if you guys thought that Denver was a joke, think again because things get serious. And that's gonna do it for this episode of Swamp Stories. Leave a like and subscribe and please let me know what you wanna see next.